In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this short confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art the Lord, thou only art holy. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may, by your grace, confess in our life the conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for Quaso Modo Geniti, the second Sunday of Easter, is written in the 37th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel, beginning at the first verse. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in a valley that was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. Behold, and they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, flesh had come upon them, skin had covered them, and there was no breath in them. 
And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, O son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the house of Yisrael. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are cut clean off. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Yisrael. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken it. I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is written in the fifth chapter of St. Paul, of St. John's first epistle, beginning at the fourth verse. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree. If we receive the testimony of God, testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his sin. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. He is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. Alleluia. Eight days later, Jesus came and stood among them and said unto them, Peace be with you. Alleluia. Holy Gospel is written in the 20th chapter of St. John, beginning at the 19th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said unto them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, Jesus said unto them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so now I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut. But Jesus came and stood among them and said unto them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and thrust it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We sing him 201. Jesus lives the victories won. Jesus lives the victories won. Death no longer can appall me. Jesus lives, death's reign is done. From the grave, Christ will recall me. Brighter seeds will then commence. This shall be my confidence. Jesus lives to him the throne. High or heaven and earth is given. I shall go where he is gone. Live and reign with him in heaven. God is faithful, down teens hands. This shall be my confidence. Jesus lives for me, he died. Hence will I to Jesus live in. Pure in heart and act abide. Praise to him and glory give in. Freely God doth a dispense, this shall be my confidence. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was a dark night, cold, on November 5th, 1786, a Sunday evening, and the Shawnee chief, Black Snake, heard the sound of singing, and so he and his war party of 12 warriors moved stealthily towards the little log cabin where a cheery yellow light from the glow of a lantern showed through the cracks in the, in the chinking. Curiously, the chief put an eye to one of the small holes and he studied the group inside the log cabin. And there he saw a group of nine 
men, women, and children didn't seem like maybe only one or two of the men could even put up a fight. And so his old face cracked to his young braves, and he said, we will kill them all and take their scalps. And then the singing stopped, and he heard a voice droning. And so he looked, he put his eye to the little hole in the wall again, and he looked through it, and he saw a pastor with his arms upraised, and he was praying, and the people had their heads down, hands together in prayer. And he said to John Kinswala, who was a Dutch, Dutchman who was on the frontier, and the chief had just captured him outside his cabin not far from, the, from where the church service was taking place. He said to the Dutch, his Dutch captive, he said, what are they doing? The Dutchman replied, is worship to God. That is how we pray. At once, at once the, the Shawnee chief motioned his braves away from the cabin saying to them, we go, no hurt the white people praying. Great spirit would be angry. And the heavy snowfall began. The great spirit would be angry. It's interesting how this Kispokotha Shawnee chief understands about our services and the worship of God what may, maybe many, many Lutherans have forgotten. Even pastors have forgotten of just how important the worship of God's church is and especially, especially the forgiveness of sins. We see this in today's gospel lesson. That something powerful is occurring that even Black Snake understood should not be interfered with. We see this when Jesus in John 20 22 says, he breathed upon them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You see, according to Martin Luther, here Christ is expressing the proper spiritual domain which is given to the church. It is the proper domain that God gives to his church, the real spiritual authority, which Luther says is greater, more enormous, and, foul, and, 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 and far-reaching than any king, prince, or lord, for it is the power and authority to forgive sins, to preach the gospel, and to remit and retain, to bind and loose sins. And what does this mean? Does this mean that the church can, can forgive you or retain your sins? Well, it, what it means is that the church is there to declare to you the forgiveness of sins, to tell you how your sins are forgiven by Christ through his, his death upon the cross and through his resurrection, and also to retain your sins, which means to tell you when you're doing things and saying things and adhering to things that, that will not be forgiven by God without repentance, to make it very clear that you're in danger of your immortal soul because you're doing such things as the scriptures say, those who do them will not receive the kingdom of heaven. Forgive or release and retain sins. It is the church's mission. And it is a very important mission, Luther says. Because you see, as, the, as that Indian chief get grass, something was occurring there that should not be interfered with, right? Something. He discerned something. And what I mean by something, it's because we Lutherans make the assertion that the one holy, universal, and Catholic church, the una sancta, the real church, not, not the hypocrites like ourselves, but the real church, right? When the, the church that always believes, that always does the right thing, that is always faithful to Christ. Because sometimes we are and sometimes we're not. Sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. But the real church is invisible. In fact, Scriptures make it very clear that you can't see the real church 
in edifices of, of stone and brick and mortar. You know, just because the architecture of a building looks like it should be maybe a church doesn't mean it's a church. Not at all. And just because there's a big crowd there and the people claim it's the church doesn't mean it's the church. In fact, sometimes I would think that maybe it isn't. And then just because people are present in that building and those people claim for themselves or others say that they are clergy, that doesn't mean that they are church because even in the most faithful parishes, pastors are flawed. We are, I am, a sinful contradiction of our Lord's example. No, the true church cannot be seen by looking at a building or looking at a crowd or looking at at the, the vestiture of those who are presiding. No, the true church is only present if the marks of the church are there. And what are the marks of the church? Well, ultimately, the true mark of the church is the forgiveness of sins. Right? Because that's what the, the pure preaching of the gospel and the right administration of the sacraments according to Jesus' institution, the sacraments, that's what those things do. Right? In baptism, we are forgiven of our sins. In the Lord's Supper, we, we taste and see the forgiveness of our sins. And in, in Christ's word, we are given saving faith that believes the promises of God and his truth and his word and the life, death, and resurrection of his son. Yes, the word and the sacraments, they are the marks of the church because through these things we receive the forgiveness of our sins. And if we resist this word, then we have our sins retained against us. It's interesting, isn't it? That the first, one of the first things Jesus says when he gathers with the disciples after his resurrection on Easter is if you, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Fascinating. It's really fascinating that he says this. And so we must ask ourselves, what exactly does Jesus mean by sin? What is sin? Sin, Luther writes, when he preached on this sermon over 500 years ago, this text, he says, sin is the burden which weighs down your conscience before God and holds you a captive before God and condemns you to eternal death. Accordingly, we are speaking here of sin in its true, proper sense, what God considers to be sin and what he punishes with eternal death, not the sins men create and call sins or the things that men say are not sins. Because we live in a time, we live in an age when, when many say that what God says is sin is not sin. And what are not sins are made sins, right? Right? But no group of people can say that, that things are sins that are not sins, nor are things not sins. Can they make them into sins? You know, the, the old... Uh, after the, after the uh, temple was destroyed, you know, the, the people of God during the Babylonian exile were faced with a, with a, great, a, a great crisis. You know, like, like us during this time, you know, they, they couldn't go to church. And so what did they, because the temple was destroyed and everything centered around the, the, the sacrifices of the temple. And what were they to do? Well, they decided they would create the Talmudic laws. The Pharisees were created keep the laws, these man-made laws that created a fence around God's Torah, his instruction, his word. So man's words were put up as, as an outer limit to God's words so that if you kept man's words, you wouldn't break God's words and you would be holy. And never again would we be exiled from our, the holy land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But were those really sins, those Pharisees in their good intention, and I think it was a good intention created. No, no, those were not sins. God does not care how many sticks you pick up on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, or if you walk another hundred yards farther than they say you should walk. No, no. And the same is true today. 
speech codes and all these other things. These are not sins. No, sin is not a temporal thing. It is not something that men vote on or, or consider or create or decide upon. No, but it is rather a terror and a burden to the conscience that accuses us before God alone and makes us guilty before God, Luther writes. And the antidote to this sin is the antidote which Christ gives to his church when he says unto them, whosoever, whatever sin you forgive or release or loose, it is forgiven, it is loosed. And whatever sin you retain, it is retained. So, as Luther says in his small catechism, when it, when it comes to the office of the keys, the, conf, the office of confession, we should consider what sins are pricking our conscience, which sins cause us pain and keep us up at night, right? To paraphrase Luther. And this is where the church's mission is so crucial for our, our lives. Because you see, without the church, without Christ's body, the una sancta, and its worship, it's speaking the word of God in truth to us, we would not be aware of our sins. Because without God's law, we really can't understand God's gospel. Because without God's law, our sins, Luther says, sleep within us. Like, like a deadly cancer growing within our lives. And it just grows and it grows and it grows and it just moves through our bodies before we're even aware of it. Because there are no symptoms. Until one day, it's revealed and we receive a diagnosis of death. And so part of the church's true function, really its primary function on this earth, is to get us to see the threat of this cancerous sin that, that is within all of us. Because as St. Paul writes in Romans chapter seven, without the law, sin is dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, to paraphrase, Luther writes that sin is always within us, but when the law doesn't come, sin for all practical purposes sleeps. And it causes us no pain and it doesn't gnaw at us until we hear God's law. And then we are deeply troubled because we all like sheep have gone astray. There is none who does, not, does right, no, not one. And that is as true for me, if not more so, than it is for you, the parishioners, and my brother, pastor, deaconess, sister deaconess. A great example of this from the Old Testament is King David. King David, who had so many wives, who had been so blessed, goes on his roof one day and he sees another man's wife and he desires her. And then he commits adultery and the child is conceived. And to hide his sin, he recalls her husband from the front, who is the commander of his army, Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah has a meeting with the king. And then he, he, the king says, go home to your house. You know, have a little R&R &R before you go back to the front. You're doing well. And Uriah says to the king, how can I go back to my house when my men sleep you know, in the, in, the, in the trenches, so to speak. And so he doesn't go back to his house. He sleeps out on the street before he goes back to the, 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 uh, to, uh, the front. So David has him murdered in a battle, makes it look like an accident. And then he takes his widow, Uriah's widow, into his household and marries the widow legitimately. And he sleeps just fine at night. No conscience bothering him about what he's done the mass dereliction of duty, the breaking of the, all the commandments that he broke, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, no murder, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not steal. All these commandments, all of them, he breaks so that he might fulfill a sin, full intention on another man's wife. And he sleeps fine at night. He's good. Things are good. It's all good. 
It's all good until Natan the prophet, Nathan the prophet, comes to him and tells him a little story about a man who had a little lamb, and this little lamb was the only lamb he had, and it was a pet of the family, and the family loved it, and there was a rich man with all these lambs, and then one day, the rich guy had a guest, and so he took that, that, man, that poor man's one little lamb, and he had it killed and prepared for the, go, for the guests. And David said, the man who has done this thing shall die. And Nathan the prophet looked at David and he said, he said, you, you are the man because you took another man's wife. His blood is on your hands. Until the law, David did not seek God's forgiveness in sackcloth and ashes nor plead for the, the infant's life. No, he didn't. Not until the prophet confronted him with God's law and retained his sin against him. Thus the church's mission is to declare God's law as an essential prerequisite to the declaration of the good news, the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. So as C.S.W. Walter would say, law and gospel must always be in their proper balance. Always. Because without God's law, our sins sleep like that undetected cancer quietly growing inside of us until it is too late. And this is why, by the way, we don't like going to church, do we? We don't. We don't like going to church because we don't want to feel that law. It's so abrasive against our lives, it forces us to see how we have failed. And we don't want to be called a poor, miserable sinner. We don't want to see that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, we do not want to see that we, like sheep, have gone astray. And there is none who does right. No, not one. And that includes us. We don't want to have that put upon us. Now, we would rather go to a place that there's a smiling preacher or a smiling guru, and the person tells us with smiles how wonderful we are and how healthy and wealthy and happy God wants to make us. That's what we want. That's why that kind of prosperity gospel, that kind of lying gospel fills up stadiums. We don't want to hear the law. But until we hear the law, we will never really desire the gospel. No, the reality is the reality seen in, this, in today's Old Testament lesson from Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14, where God takes the prophet to in a large valley that is full of dry bones. And the reality of that valley full of dry bones, Ezekiel realizes, is that those bones are his bones. They're our bones. They're my bones. And until God's word is preached to those bones, to the law and the gospels declared to those bones, those bones remain dead. But an amazing thing happens. As he preaches to those bones, those bones come together in a great rattling. And then skin and sinews come over those bones, and those bones become human beings. And then God, then he prays the breath, enter the bones, and the, and the breath enters the bones, and they become alive, living men, women, and children. And so it is with us. When we come to where the gospel is preached, and where the sacraments are celebrated according to the gospel, we who are dry bones are given flesh and blood and the Spirit of God. Yes, this is what the gospel does. This is what the good news of the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross achieves for us. It covers our deadness in a new life, an eternal life. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he appeared in the midst of his disciples that, that first day of the week, that Sunday, and he said unto them, Peace be with you, peace to you as the father has sent me i also now send you receive the holy spirit 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Yes, true peace. The arena of Christ, the peace that surpasses all human understanding that keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace is attainable only through the forgiveness that Jesus Christ, through his church, through his word, through his sacraments gives us. Which Christ freely offers us through his death upon the cross and his resurrection. Yes, yes, Jesus died to pay for our sins as the law demands because our sins, our sins merit death. Christ paid for those sins with his death. So now he may give us the life that he achieves for us there upon that cross. And all we must do is believe it. That's it. Believe that God is not a liar when he speaks. Believe that God's word is true. Yes, to have faith, as Luther says, in the saving sufficiency of Jesus' death and resurrection. For Habakkuk the prophet says, the just shall live by faith. This was the great conviction of Luther as he struggled to know whether he, where he could find a gracious God. He understood that the just shall live by faith. And this means believing that what Christ has done overcomes what our sins in the sinful world have done. It's lies, it's fears, it's distractions are overcome by Christ, the one who says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot, him who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. For whoever is born of God has overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith as John writes in his first epistle, our faith. Faith, St. Paul says, that comes from hearing, and hearing that comes from the word of God. Faith that believes that Jesus speaks the truth when he says to the, the, the disciples who cowered behind locked doors, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace that is from above and for the well-being of the churches of Christ and for the godly unity of Christendom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for those who in faith, piety, and the fear of God offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew and Eric, our shepherds and bishops in Christ, for all pastors and teachers and all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our United States and all of our people, for Donald, our president, the Congress of the United States, for Kay, our governor, and the legislature of Alabama, for our judges and magistrates and all who serve in public office, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the sorrowing, for those who mourn, for those who are in need and distress, for the homebound and the infirm, especially we pray this day for Edgar, and we also pray for Brian, 
And we pray for all others, Heavenly Father, who are in our families, who are sick, or who are unwell, or who are in danger. We pray for them, to whom death is drawing near and for us all, that when our last hour shall come, we may depart this life in the confidence of the sure faith, the consolation of a right, devout and holy hope, and in the communion of Christ's holy church. Let us pray to the Lord. We're calling those who have gone before us in the faith and rejoicing who share with them the Sabbath rest which Christ has won for his people, that together with them we may be found faithful in the day of judgment and rejoice in the day of the resurrection of the dead. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray especially for all those who are sick uh, with the, uh, the, the coronavirus 19, novel coronavirus 19. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, look down from heaven, visit, relieve thy servants who are sick. We offer our supplications on their behalf. Look upon them with the eyes of thy mercy and give them comfort and sure confidence in thee. Defend them from the dangers of the enemy and keep them in perpetual safety and peace through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We also pray for Ed and, and Brian. Almighty and everlasting God, the eternal salvation of them that believe, hear our prayers on behalf of our of our members, our ser- your servants, Edgar and Brian, who are very, very sick. We pray and implore thy aid and mercy for them, that they would be restored to health, that they may render thanks in thy church. We ask this through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit. One God now and forever. Amen. And finally, we pray um, for the leaders of our country that they might make good decisions. O merciful Father in heaven, who holdest in thy hand all the might of man, and who has ordained the powers to be for the punishment of evil and the praise of that which is good, and to whom all rule and authority in the kingdoms of the world, we humbly beseech thee, Graciously regard thy servant, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, K. Ivey, the Governor of Alabama, and all other magistrates and those in authority, and all rulers of the earth. May all of them receive thy, the sword of thy, command, thy ministers and bear it according to thy commandment. May they enlighten and defend them by thy name, O God, and grant them wisdom and understanding that under their peaceable governance, thy people may be guarded and directed in righteousness, quietness, and unity. Protect and prolong their lives, O God, of our salvation, that we with them may show forth praise of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, we pray, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his peace. Amen.